right, so good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jesse, and if you're joining us for the first time, and I know a lot of you are today, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science here at Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. If you didn't get a chance to check it out, I want to bring this up really quick. Uh, we did our Global Biodiversity Festival over the weekend, which was the largest program not only that we've ever done, but the largest conservation program of all time. 150 broadcasts, over 72 straight hours of broadcasting, featuring conservationists from every continent and over 50 countries on the planet. So check out globalbiofest.com. So much to explore, so much to learn, and I hope you guys have a great time. Earlier today, we were joined at the Toucan Rescue Ranch in Costa Rica with Otter on World Otter Day, and we just wrapped up with Colin Stevenson at Crocodiles of the World in the UK. We're bringing it back to North America now, here in Canada, joined live by Dr. Erica Caden, who's going to talk to us about her amazing work at Snow Lab, one of the elite and iconic research facilities in Canada and on the entire planet. So without further ado, I'm going to bring in Dr. Caden to blow your mind today, a little bit of exploring the mysteries of the universe with her. And so thank you so much for joining us again, Dr. Caden. Take us away. Hi, Jesse. Thanks for having me. Uh, so yeah, I have some slides to show about Snow Lab since we can't all go there. Um, but we can bring those up. So here. <clears throat> so like Jesse said, I'm a research scientist at Snow Lab. And here are some pictures of me actually at work. And yes, that wrench is actually used to tighten some nuts that fit in uh, that actually fit in there. Snow Lab is an underground uh, research facility. Uh, primarily, we study astroparticle physics, so I'll tell you a little bit about what that is, but we also have some biology experiments, and I'll tell you a little bit about them. We are in Sudbury, Ontario, which is where the little purple pin is in the big map of North America there. Um, and this is a picture of our surface building. Now, luckily, it doesn't look like that right now because we are in spring uh, and really sliding quite quickly into summer. Uh, but the heart of Snow Lab isn't its surface facility, but it's the underground lab. So we are in an active nickel mine called Creighton Mine that's been operating for over 100 years. So they're still mining nickel uh, out, of, out of this mine. So if you, I don't know if you can see my mouse or not, but all of the red area is the ore body. So where the, the nickel has existed uh, or used to exist as they're taking it out. Um, but we are far away from the ore body. So you go two kilometers down and then uh, another kilometer and a half walk to get to our actual uh, mines, uh, our actual lab site. Um, so I have a quick video of what the process is like. Uh, I hope the sound will share. Is the sound working? Unfortunately not, but you can tell us a little bit about what's happening and talk over it. Sorry, Herc. Oh. Yeah, perfect. I can just tell you what's happening then. Um, so this is the cage ride. So the cage is the, uh, <clears throat> the industrial term for the elevator that takes us down. So who you're seeing here are all of my coworkers, other scientists and other employees at the lab. We have uh, over a hundred employees. Uh, so that is people to clean and maintain the lab, engineers to help us design uh, and build our experiments, um, cleaners to help keep our entire facility uh, at the cleanliness level we need. So, yep, we're two kilometers underground and then we have to walk through this drift. We have, to, the drift is the hallway, uh, hallway, I guess, in the, in the mine. And we are in all of our mine safety gear right here. So we have to wash our boots off and go inside and completely change our clothes. So you'll see everyone here now has different coveralls, but we still have hard hats and steel toed boots to run and work on our experiments. Uh, so this is the experiment I work on called Snow Plus. This one is a dark matter experiment. So I'll talk a little bit more about neutrinos and dark matter later. Um, but this is a different view of some of the experiments here and people working on them as they're being installed. So yeah, everything is super, super clean. We see plastic uh, kind of protecting things and people in additional levels of clean wear and gloves. And this is the data coming out of the detectors. So this is what it looks like when all of our, uh, when we have information coming out of our particle detectors. 
so like I said, we're a particle astrophysics lab. So you might think it's funny to study the the cosmos, the the stars and the sun from deep underground, but it's actually the the two kilometers of Earth that lets us study these particles because the normal cosmic ray radiation, which is completely harmless to us, uh, is would create backgrounds, would create too much noise inside our very sensitive detectors to be able to uh, actually see any of the signals of the, the particles that we're looking for. So you might've gotten a feel as they were walking around in the video, but this is a map of our underground facility. So we have a number of current experiments all in blue, and I'll talk about a, a few of them. <clears throat> But the lab also has its own facilities to help support the experiments. So uh, background counting to make sure our the materials that our detectors are made of are clean enough. We have um, chemical support lab, a machine shop. I don't know if you guys have ever seen a machine shop. There's lots of big machinery and they're really dirty places because you've cut a lot of like metal filings off of a lot of things. We have the cleanest machine shop you will ever see in the world. Um, to help build the experiments uh, underground in a clean way. Um, and we also have some future experiments that are in the process of, of moving in, but we are pretty full right now, which is really exciting. So again, I've kind of alluded to this, the particles that we study at Snow Lab in our astroparticle physics program are neutrinos and dark matter. So unfortunately, they don't really look like this, like these cute plushies that are much more fun uh, to use for explaining, we actually, uh, we have no idea what dark matter looks like. And we know that neutrinos are the smallest bits of almost nothing that we can see. So you guys might be familiar with the periodic table of the elements. So that gives you all the properties of all the different elements we have. Well, this is pretty much the same thing, but for our fundamental particles. So we call this our standard model. And so I've used the more pictures of these plushies that I love for our plushie standard model. So we, uh, you might have no heard of quarks, which make up protons and neutrons. And of course, protons and neutrons are way, what make up our atoms with electrons. So we have these three guys you might have known. You definitely have heard of electrons. That's what gives us our electricity. So associated with electrons and the other uh, leptons are neutrinos. So these are teensy tiny particles, the smallest, smallest uh, massive particles that we have. And massive meaning that they have mass because we know that photons don't have mass. Um, but they are very, 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 very difficult to detect. So you have to build these ultra clean, ultra sensitive detectors, deep, generally deep underground to be able to detect neutrinos and study them and learn about their properties. So we see that uh, the, the numbers, the, the mass of the particles that are all given, except for the tree neutrinos, because we don't know how much they weigh. There's a lot that we don't know about neutrinos, even though we've been studying them for almost 100 years now. So it's very, uh, it makes them, for me, for being a neutrino researcher, very exciting to know that there's so much more to learn about these particles. And we don't even see, the, the dark matter particle on here. We don't even know what it is yet. It hasn't even made it into our standard model, which is then also interesting because it tells us that this model, which is a, a, an amazing mathematical prediction of almost everything we know, everything we see can fit into the standard model, except the mass of neutrinos and except for dark matter. So to know that we have this beautiful picture that explains so much, but it's missing pieces is very exciting because it means that we have more questions. There's more for us to learn. We haven't hit the end of knowledge at this point. Uh, there's still so much more that we get to discover. So one of the things that we're trying to discover about neutrinos is some of their fundamental properties. We know that there's this cool reaction called uh, double beta decay, where you have an atom, uh, there's just a handful of nucleus, a handful of elements that can do undergo this decay, where you have two neutrons uh, that decay into two protons and release two antineutrinos and two electrons. So this could happen for about 20 different elements. And it's it's cool, it's interesting. It's uh, They can't undergo a single beta decay, but they can happen if it's twice at the exact same time, 
these decays can happen. But what would be really interesting if, if, if the neutrino is its own antiparticle, and because of all of those other uh, properties that I had mentioned, uh, the, the neutrino is the only particle that could be its own antiparticle. If it is, we might see a decay where instead of two antineutrinos coming out, there is nothing coming, two antineutrinos and two electrons, all you get is the two electrons and the antineutrino kind of self-annihilates inside. So we're looking for this reaction. So we have a whole bunch of, a whole, a large amount of one of the isotopes that can undergo this reaction to see if sometimes we see this reaction instead. Because if we see this, if we only see the two electrons and just their energy coming out, then we know that there have then we haven't seen the neutrinos. And so that will tell us more in, interesting information about the neutrinos. So this is the goal of the Snow Plus experiment, which is one of the projects that I work on. And so this is a photograph of the detector. And it's maybe hard to tell on this scale, but this sphere is 12 meters in diameter, or it's about uh, oh, close to 40 feet um, in diameter. And so this is ma massive. <laughs> Uh, filled with a mineral oil that has been filled with tellurium, which is one of the isotopes that can undergo that reaction. So we're looking to see if we see this reaction, if we see signatures that a neutrino and antineutrino can self-annihilate, that they're the same thing. This is the goal of my experiment. So again, this is an actual photograph. This is not an artistic rendering. We have cameras deployed to be able to monitor some of the hardware of this experiment but it also creates really pretty pictures. One of the other things that we are looking for about neutrinos is supernova. We know that when a star, a certain kinds of stars can go nova, they explode in this way after they have gone through their entire fusion process, which is how stars burn, how we get light. Um, the core can collapse. And when that happens, when you have the core and it's burned through all of its material and it collapses on itself, you get a whole bunch of neutrinos coming out. Neutrinos take away like 99% of the energy of the supernova. So all the light that we see is only 1% of the energy. Everything else is taken away by neutrinos, which is so, so cool. So we expect to see some of these events in our you know, kind of local cluster of galaxies about three a century. And the last one we saw was 30, about 30 years ago in 1987. Oh, I guess that's 34 years ago now. So we're really kind of due for one. We're expecting to see one hopefully soon. So by studying the neutrinos that come from the supernova, that can tell us a lot about the explosion mechanisms inside, way more than the light can tell us. So by studying these supernova neutrinos, we can learn a lot about these, these explosions. And Supernovas are the only way that we get any element beyond iron in our periodic table. So we can fuse hydrogen into helium. We can fuse helium into lithium and beryllium and so on until you get to iron and then we're stuck. Then you have to explode the elements into existence, which is, which is how we get them. So to now understand more about these explosion processes, we can use the neutrinos to, to study and, and get, understand them better. So this is another experiment that I uh, participate in called HALO, that is a dark, that I'm sorry, that is a dedicated supernova detector. So it's just sitting there live, taking data, waiting for a supernova to happen, which is very cool. So we can, uh, so this is an image of a galaxy and I show this to kind of show how big they are, but the galaxies are held together by dark matter. So dark matter is like this invisible space glue that holds all the stars and galaxies together as they're rotating around the center. So if you're on, say, a merry-go-round and it's spinning really fast and you have to hold on really tight to the edge to fly off, the dark matter is kind of like what's holding, doing the holding on. Uh, so we can see its effects but we haven't actually seen dark matter yet. We know it makes up about 22% of the galaxy, 
and we don't quite know what it is. We can see its effects. We can see how it bends light also. So some of these uh, galaxies look like kind of a bendy when some of them look straight. So we know that there's a giant bit of dark matter here that is bending these this light, but we don't know. Uh, so we, we know that it exists, but we still haven't seen the dark matter particle yet. We have been designing all of these detectors to try to look for dark matter. So at Snow Lab, we have five different experiments looking for dark matter in all different ways. So we have Deep uses uh, liquid argon. Uh, News G will use uh, helium gas. Uh, Pico will use uh, ref uh, superheated refrigerator fluid. And uh, Cute and Super CDMS use uh, pure germanium crystals. And they all are looking for a dark matter particle to bump against one of the particles inside their detector and leave a little bit of light or a little bit of heat. Um, and then we can look for, measure that light and heat uh, or, or a little bit of uh, radiation and look for that with our the, the sensors in these detectors. Unfortunately, we're really good at not finding dark matter. So here is, this looks like a really complicated uh, plot display of data, but I can break it down. That here we have the dark matter particle size. So they can be really small or they can get pretty big. And here we have the dark matter particle interaction likelihood. If how how well how likely is it to hit into our material into our material? So if it's really bigger, it's probably easier to hit. If it's smaller, um, you need uh, it's a little harder harder to hit. But all of these lines represent areas that we have confirmed using all different detector technologies that we don't see a dark, that there is not a dark matter particle up here. There might be one here. This is unexplored area and there might be one down here. But once you get to this dotted line, it gets really hard to see a dark matter interaction because it will look similar to a neutrino interaction, that our dark matter detectors will be so sensitive that they will see neutrino interactions. So we are trying to cover all of this area to see if there is a dark matter particle of this size and of this uh, small interaction or of this big, uh, smaller size but bigger interaction to see if we can find the dark matter particle here. If we don't, that's also interesting because we need to change our entire paradigm of thinking. That means that there's something else in the world that is that is making this and we, we just don't understand it yet. So for to me, for all of this, this is all really exciting astroparticle physics. But what else we do at Snow Lab, because we're in this deep underground facility, we can do some interesting biology experiments too. So we can study Fruit, using the fruit fly model, we can study the effects of increased pressure on our metabolism. So there are two different fl fruit fly models and the and each model or each um, uh, kind of species of fruit flies has uh, male and female. So you can take down two different species, look at both uh, sexes, look at a huge number, like 1,200 flies, and do a bunch of experiments on them and to see how does being deep underground, there's much, it's about 30% higher pressure underground. Uh, do a bunch of different experiments on them, like making them walk on a fly, fruit fly treadmill here to see how their metabolism changes. If the different species have different changes, if the different genders have different, uh, sexes have different changes, if, um, you know, being on doing everything to the same surf fruit flies on surface for underground, if they have different changes. So you, what the what this researcher has found out that exercise and being underground, they both shift some of the uh, metabolites, some of the proteins, uh, processes in our metabolism are changed between um, underground and surface if they're exercising or not exercising in male and female. So that is what these plots show. So this is really interesting. And all of this can then eventually make mining safer. If we can figure out better ways to adapt our metabolism to this higher pressure underground uh, work environment, then we can make it much safer 
for people who work underground. We can also use our deep underground. We go underground for particle physics to remove all the background radiation on the surface. Um, so what, so, and this is radiation that all biological systems on earth have evolved to, uh, to experience life under. So maybe this cosmic radiation kind of hitting one of our molecules and then our molecule learns how to fix itself or repair itself. So if we go into a system, an area where there is not all of this background radiation, as in during the development stages, do we, if they don't learn, or if our molecules and cells don't learn how to repair themselves, does that make them more susceptible to other kinds of radiation to cancer, things like cancer, uh, later on in life? So is maybe a little bit of radiation exp exposure actually good for us? This is what uh, this group, uh, the repair project is doing, um, looking for the biological effects of the absence of natural background radiation in mammalian cells and yeast and in nematode words, worms using a special uh, uh, glove box with a low radon environment um, in, a, in a kind of lead castle where they grow their cells and evaluate, um, look at their responses. So there is some biology that we are able to do because of our unique facility underground. So. Uh, Jesse and Joe and George came to visit Snow Lab once before. So I like to show them off here to show that it really is a real place underground. And if there's, uh, in addition to any questions you might, guys might have, there's lots more information at snowlab.ca and at Snow Lab Science. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much. And I can attest it's a real place. It's really real. It's super cool. And, and that video <laughs> at the beginning highlighting how to get down there is one of the most amazing things I ever had the chance to experience in my life. So super, super cool and so nice to get to showcase that. Um, Erica, this was so much fun. If you want to come out of screen share, have a bit of a conversation with us. We've got already a whole bunch of groups on YouTube, over 100 viewers. So welcome into all our YouTube friends. Um, and I'm going to take some questions from there first and give our live classes just a second to put their thinking caps on and come up with some queries for us. And so first, you brought this on yourself, Erica. Uh, what's the first question here? From uh, Caitlin wants to know, how do the fly treadmills work? What's going on with those? <laughs> so the flies themselves stay inside their test tubes. But if you spin the test tubes at just the right speed, uh, they're not going to stay and fall and they're not going to fly. They will just walk. So you can change the speed and they they just walk. And they so the researcher would, would exercise the flies and then um, uh, eva use, and you, know, you eventually uh, then use those flies as, con there are control flies that don't walk and then flies that do walk. So you can use them as your test subjects. Very, very cool. I've seen pictures of this action. You can check out the Snow Lab site as well. There's some really cool stuff there. Uh, but great first question. All right, I'm coming to Mr. Baxter's class in a minute in Clinton, Ontario, but I like this question from Ms. Snow's class. Malia wants to know, is the dark matter you study, the stuff people were hit by and turned into metahumans in the flash? So what's going on? Is this like a Hulk situation where dark matter could really, I don't know, lead to some cool outcomes for superheroes or anything like that? Any, any indication of that or no? I think the Hulk got hit by gamma radiation, if I remember correctly. Uh -huh. And, uh, is, oh, was it dark matter in the flash? Hmm. I don't know. I mean, so <laughs> what's interesting is that we are hit by dark matter and neutrinos all the time. If you hold out your thumbnail, then you get 65 million neutrinos from the sun, only from the sun, flying through your thumbnail every second. They're all around us, but they're so, so difficult to, to stop. They just zip through all the time. Yeah. So you have to really make a sensitive detector to get them to actually stop. And this is what that I love harping on when we come to Snow Lab is the sensitivity of these detectors and the need to block out this noise. Just like if you went out in broad daylight and someone was flying, you know, a hundred kilometers in the air and they, they lit a match, you wouldn't see that match because the sun is so bright that it drowns it out. You guys are trying to find that match amidst that and trying to block out all that extra, you know, data, information, light, sound, whatever to get the research that you're doing. And so your detectors are so sensitive. I always like to come up with analogies for this, that if someone were to light a map from the moon, you guys could easily see that comparatively if you were using these detectors, right? 
Yeah, so our phone detectors are super, super, super sensitive. But yeah, another good analogy is uh, going to a concert. So if you're listening to a huge symphony orchestra, and if I dropped a pin in the back of the, of the theater, you wouldn't hear it. So we have to go deep underground to block out all the symphony noise so you can hear that pin drop. Yeah, super, super cool. I love this stuff. Um, let's head to Mr. Baxter first. You guys are sharing great questions in the chat, but I will come to all our teachers live, so just hold tight. Uh, Mr. Baxter, if you want to unmute that mic, come on in. You're good to go. Hi. Thank you very much for uh, sharing your experiences. Uh, we were wondering if you were in the SNOW Plus experiment, are you directly detecting the neutrino annihilation, like a photon release, or are you detecting the absence of neutrinos produced? So that's a great question. For the neutrinoless double beta decay uh, events, we are, what we actually detect is the energy of the two electrons. So in the two neutrino decay, so you have the two electrons and the two neutrinos, uh, that energy of the decay is shared by all four particles. So the electrons will have a broad spectrum of energies that they have. So we would see a big lump if you distribute all the energies. If it's the zero neutrino reaction that, that is undergone, then all of that energy of the decay is shared by just the two electrons. So you would have a... Um, a tiny blip of energy at the very end, if, if you're plotting this energy, then they would have a single peak of energy instead of a broad distribution that would cover the whole range of possible energies. So, so yeah, it's really interesting that we are studying, that we learn more about neutrinos in a reaction where there are no neutrinos. That's a great question. It is a great question. And I want to stress, because we've got kids from grade 6 to 12 today, if someone wanted to be as smart as you when they grew up, if someone wanted to follow your path and end up uh, being an amazing particle physicist, what would they do? <laughs> so you would, I mean, if you're me. <laughs> so I went to university, and I, I ended up studying physics. But I didn't pick physics my first year. I was undecided my first year, because I thought there were so many interesting things to study. So I finally settled down to physics. and. At, I guess somewhere in my third year, my advisor asked me if I wanted to go to grad school. And I said, I think I need to get a job. But he's like, no, no, you go to grad school and you get grants and uh, you work while you're in school and then you get a better job at the end of it. So and that's what I ended up doing. And so I'm originally from the States. Uh, I went to Drexel University in Philadelphia and was there for eight years working on my master's and PhD, which is a little bit of a long time, but uh, it's but it's really not that much of a long time. So basically, you just go to school for a very, very, very long time, very long time. And you know what? I think, you know, as I said before in our broadcast, when I was in grade four, when I was in grade six, that seemed really daunting to think that you go all the way to grade 12, and then you've got school and more school and more school on top of that. It's a little yeah, scary. Four more years, and then right. eight more years. Right. But you end up in a situation where you're still quite young at the end of all this and you have a really fulfilling, exciting career. You get to work doing exactly what you love to do. You get to collaborate with people around the world. You get to make a lot of money as a researcher if you're really keen on that aspect of it. And it's just a fantastic opportunity to sort of understand some of the mysteries of the universe if you do want to take the path of science. So very, very cool. And I'm really glad we could answer that. Um, Miss Douglas's class, if you guys want to unmute your mic too, in fact, all our teachers can unmute their mic today. Uh, it makes it easier for us when we go to Q&A. Miss Douglas is joining us in Mississauga. Uh, if you want to come on in for a question, go for it. Yeah, our students were wondering if we were to find dark matter, what would we use it for? Like how? Unmute. Nope, I heard that. So what would we use dark matter for if we found it? We don't know yet. So this is really interesting is that one of the things that we're that we're trying to understand is we're just trying to understand our entire um, trying to understand our world by developing the technology to try to better understand our world. We can then often use that technology for other things. So the um, the the particle accelerators that uh, lots of um, lots of particle physicists uh, use these, like the big one in CERN. There's one in Fermi Lab. There's one in a Triumph Lab in uh, Vancouver. Those have led to the development of uh, proton therapy for cancer. So you can send a beam of protons to hit exactly where the tumor is, and they don't damage their surrounding cells. And you can send them with the exact right energy to just hit the tumor and not go any further. 
So that has developed from particle physics research. So what, what will we use dark matter for? I'm not sure. Personally, I think holding our galaxies together is a pretty good use for it. But the technologies that we develop to study dark matter, I think is really what are what's applicable about it. Um, Snow Lab, or, and actually many physicists in Canada and the US and in Italy used their uh, knowledge of uh, gas handling and uh, pressure systems that we use in a lot of our experiments to make a new ventilator at the beginning of the pandemic when it was uh, really needed when people were running out of ventilators for those who are in hospital. So that's, again, a technology experience that we have that we were able to develop that is open source software and uh, off the shelf parts that is now being produced in Canada and in the US and elsewhere in the world. I always love your talks because pretty much uniquely among our presentations, we really focus on the importance of basic research, just trying to understand the universe for its own sake, not only because it's inherently valuable and exciting to know this, but because who knows where it leads. I mean, two examples I love, Albert Einstein led the foundation for lasers as an idea over a hundred years ago, and now they're used for mapping the entire planet through GPS and scanning absolutely everything you're ever going to buy, ever. You know, scientists about 10 years ago were studying how bacteria fight off infections. How could that be useful? How could that be interesting? A bacteria, you know, you're fighting off a cold. And now our most powerful genetic engineering technology on the planet has come about exactly from that. So it's really, really exciting to probe these mysteries and to invest those resources into doing it because it's fantastic and who knows where it leads. So great question, Ms. Douglas. All right, I want to go to Mr. Lyons class. He's been asking some great questions in the chat. So Mr. Lyons is joining us in Toronto, right down the street from Ms. Douglas. Come on in and uh, take us away. Hi, thanks for having us. Yeah, I'm going to combine the two questions. We were wondering, uh, what was the thinking behind making the the, the lab near uh, a nickel mine? And also, what has been your most successful project? So the the lab is in a nickel mine because we knew it had to be deep underground. Um, and it grew from the original snow experiment. Uh, so, so this is kind of why I'll, I'll talk about the snow experiment. Um, it was an idea to use heavy water, which is the water that is in the nuclear reactors in Canada, to study the nutrients that were coming from the sun. So to build this experiment, it had to be in Canada, and it had to be deep underground. And it had to be in a place that was next to a university that had a physics department. So um, a bunch of scientists looked at all over the lines, all in Canada, what, what, which ones were next to universities that had physics departments, and that we're willing to host a bunch of crazy scientists who wanted to build this experiment. And it turned out that at the time, Inc the company was called Inco. Um, they said, sure. And it was next to Laurentian University. And they uh, did all of the engineering. What would it be to excavate this whole new cavern separate from the ore body? Um, how much would it be? Uh, and then to what would it take to create this experiment? So that is. Uh, I guess, I think that was the question of why we're here. And then uh, what was the most successful experiment that I've worked on? Yeah. Well, so I didn't personally work on the snow experiment, but I would say that, and that's uh, confirming that neutrinos have this weird pro property called oscillation. So I think I, I mentioned that neutrinos are weird. Neutrinos are really, really weird. They change what kinds they are. So you might've noticed I had three different kinds in the plushies, an orange one, a yellow one and a red one, they change between what kind they are as they travel through space. So all the previous experiments looking for neutrinos from the sun were only looking for the yellow kind and they weren't coming up with the right number as predictions were. So were the detectors bad or were the, the predictions bad? But it turns out that neutrinos change what they do as they travel through space. So the snow experiment was sensitive to all three kinds of neutrinos. So they confirmed that, yep, all the neutrinos that were coming from the sun are actually getting here. They're just changing what kind they are. So that uh, I would say was the most ex successful experiment, uh, one of the most successful experiments in neutrino physics. So that was here in Canada. Um, and from that experiment, then the lab expanded into all of Snow Lab. And for, uh, for his work, the leader of that experiment, Art McDonald, won the Nobel Prize in Physics in 2015. 
Super, super cool. I love that story. Very, very neat. And I mean, this is a, the, the lesson for our kids is you guys get into a position where you're learning about physics and learning about particle physics, especially, is that when you get down to the realm of the very, very small, all the things that we think of as normal and standard in the universe break down. We have some very, very strange things going on. But I, I think uh, Richard Feynman, one of the, sort of the iconic leaders of talking about physics to the public, is like, if you think you truly understand it, you don't truly understand it. Like, it's, it's wild and crazy. It's a, a magical mystery. We're always trying to make a sense of these really fantastical things happening. So thank you for getting a chance to share that today with us. Um, Erica, we have time for a couple more questions. So I want to bring in Mr. Carr's class. Mr. Carr's our second group today, joining from Calgary, which is really exciting. Uh, come on in, guys. Hi, how are you? I'm coming to Hi. you from Calgary. Uh, we got a grade nine class, and this is the first year that You're this group. Um, <laughs> I'm okay. You're good. Hey, I'm good. I'm <laughs> good. Uh, first time this class has ever studied chemistry, and uh, you know, they started learning about electrons, protons, and neutrons, and you just blew their mind today and talking about this dozen other subparticles that are there. And just wondering, you know, I've been reading about, you know, are we ever going to achieve this unified theory of everything? And just your opinion on are, are we getting close to that? Is it going to be 50, 100 years down the road? No, no. Oh, man. For, uh... <laughs> <laughs> I hope it's not 100 years. Uh, but it, it might be on the order of the, the 20 years. So we understand. So maybe you guys have heard of the four fundamental forces at this point or you will very soon. So there's gravity, which is what sticks uh, everything together. Um, so we don't all, you know, it's why we stay on the ground. Uh, there is the uh, the strong nuclear force, which is what holds the nuclei together. There's the weak nuclear force, which is what holds the atoms together. And there's the electromagnetic force, which is deals with light and, uh, and then atoms interacting with each other. So we can tie this, the uh, the strong force and the electro uh, no the electro weak and the strong force together, but we still can't quite figure out how to try uh, get gravity to work in there. So this is the, this grand unified theory. There's still a lot we don't quite get about gravity. Uh, so I think we're definitely in in longer time scales. Uh, but it is, again, the goal. So I am an experimentalist, which means I like to work hands-on on the project. But the other branch of particle physics is theoretical. So it's the people who are working, who come up with these models, who are thinking of all of these ideas and trying to put new, uh, new ideas into how everything fits together. So they come up with the ideas and then we build the projects to test their ideas. And then we get results and they have to incorporate their results back into their new ideas to say, oh, this idea is, uh, is a bunch of nonsense. This is never gonna work. Or, oh, if I just add this new, this new tweak in, maybe I can make all of the data fit together. And then we go and build a new experiment to test that. So it's a lot of back and forth of, of all of this thinking. S soon, 20, 20 years, 50 years. Hopefully, I think things like string theory and fusion and all these things, they're always about 20, 30 years away. Funny how that works, but I, I wish you well. And if anyone's going to lead the charge and solve it, it is you because we've got a chance to hear all about all these amazing things you're doing today. So great question, Mr. Carr, and, and thanks for that, Dr. Katie. Um, time flies and you're having fun. We've got time for one more. So I'm going to head to Emery Bill for Miss Mathis' class. Uh, come on in, guys, and uh, wrap us up. Hi, we were just wondering, is the amount of dark matter limited or not? And if the amount of dark matter changes, how would that affect life on Earth? Those are great questions. So we know that of all of the stuff that the universe is made out of, there is about 75% of it is dark energy. So that's what is helping things expand. There is 75, so then it's about 20% is dark matter. So that's what holds the galaxies together. And then just 5% is the stuff we see, all the planets, all the stars, everything in the back of your closet, the stuff in the bottom of your backpack, that's all 5%, not 10, 5, 5% of what exists in the entire universe, all, all of the stars, 5%. So if there was, so I don't think it's that the amount of dark matter is increased or decreasing, or if it was a different amount. Okay, so if there was 
if we started out and there was a different amount of dark matter, so that might make it different how the galaxies um, and planets kind of clumped together. So after the Big Bang, there was a bunch of dust and it was kind of swirling around and then started to clump together. So if there was more dark matter, it might clump in a different way. And if there was less dark matter, it might clump in a different way. So really there was just the right amount of dark matter for everything to be exactly as it was, as it is. So if there's more or less, we might not be here. It's really cool. There's a book about that, that exact concept. It's like the perfect tuned universe or the fine tuned universe. It's about those sort of fundamental concepts. I forget exactly what it's called. I want to say it's Martin Rees, but anyway, very cool question. There's so many books that come close to explaining this in a way that is totally accessible for the general public. Like Mr. Carr, I've read a lot of these books. They're great. I always go like, yes, now I understand it. And I pick up page one of the next and I'm like, I don't know anymore. But very, there's, very, oh, there's a new one that, uh, that I haven't read yet, but she is yeah. an amazing theoretical astrophysicist, Trondra Prescott Weinstein. It's called the disordered, uh, the disordered cosmos. And it is, that should be next on your list to read. It's next on my list. Okay, so we have some older kids, Disordered Cosmos teachers, check that out. Uh, very, very cool and uh, recommended by a star herself. So thank you for that pick. That's awesome. Um, guys, this has been so much fun. Thank you for the real enthusiasm and great questions today. We have so many classes tuning in, a lot of uh, wide grade range. So always a real pleasure. Uh, I did want to point out again, the place you can go to learn more is snowlab.ca. So much there, an incredible site, uh, great social media as well. So Dr. Caden uh, gets to do some pretty incredible work and hopefully you guys can keep the learning going when you're done. Um, is there any last message you want to share with us before we wrap up and bring the teachers in to say goodbye? Um, so there was an early question about all the schooling I had to do to get here. So one of the things that I would like to, to re, uh, reiterate is that uh, you don't have to be have perfect grades the whole time to get here. You don't have to ace all of your exams. You just have to be find it interesting enough to keep going when you hit some stumbling blocks. So, like there were there are plenty of times that I maybe could have given up, but I found all of this too interesting. Like what what else am I gonna do? There's there's nothing that I find as interesting as particle physics. So you don't have to be the top at everything to get to where you can do this job. You just have to keep trying and have the, find something that you're passionate about to stick at it, to know that you're not the best, but you wanna keep going at it to get better. That's, that's what you need to do to, to get far. I couldn't think of a more beautiful message to end on, and I always love when you share that with us. I think it's so important for our kids to hear. Uh, and I, I truly, you know, at, to get to a level where you are with the work that you get to do, I think that that sentiment rings true even more than it does than most. So thank you so much for your time today, as always. Um, and as you know, what we do to end every broadcast, I'm going to bring in all our teachers to say a big thank you and farewell. So Mr. Baxter, Ms. Douglas, Mr. Lyons, Mr. Carr, and Ms. Massa, thank you guys so, so much for joining us. 